complimentary color scale, but I'm excited yeah. to see what everybody comes up with. Yeah, that'd be good. Let's get us a, a brand, let's start branding this. Yeah. yeah. Good, thank yeah, you. Because I want my club sport coat, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do t-shirts. Yeah. We're gonna do t-shirts. Yeah. 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 I've got a, I have a so good pick hookup for t-shirts. T-shirts, we can do Getting pretty inexpensive. Caps, we can do anything like that from the I know a guy. It would be, yeah. I know a guy. We need a brand. You yeah. might get more attention when people are out. And yeah. I don't think we can recognize people if we don't know them because they have some of yeah. you know. yeah. We yeah. could do a sticker on the back of the cars. Oh, yeah. Who would do Yeah, we could do that. Or maybe do a magnet. Make it do a magnet. Yeah. What's the deadline for this submission? March 11th. Um, it would, the photo exhibit is in. A couple of weeks, couple of weeks well, we, so we would need it probably before, before, before then. Starting yeah. submitting to yeah. We'll have more information on, on the photo submission soon. Yeah. We're going to have a little meeting later tonight. I'll post it on Facebook and we'll put a deadline in there. Good, thank you. Okay. I know what's here. Can't see that song before. But that blue light hit me in the sky. Don't blind yourself. Okay, um, updated photo. What are, what are photo fund photo fundraiser. Photo fundraiser. Thank okay, you. Um, we finally got back to meeting again, together again. It's been great. Um, we actually got really far. I think I'm down to two products. So I need awesome. you guys to decide. We'll look at that tonight. One's actually a little more expensive, but it has blind voting, and I think that's what we're thinking. Huh. Um, we have. I think we're starting to get our flyers built up. We just need the logo, like Natalie mm -hmm. was saying. Um, one of the things that we're looking at doing is once we actually start broadcasting this out, we want to probably broadcast it out to other groups too, because we we want to invite anybody in the state, because it's not meant just to highlight the, the lake, it's meant to highlight the state and any local photographer in the state. State of Utah. The state of Utah. Real quick, Jason, I don't know, Mike knows what we're talking about. Can you okay. Him the, so we're version? yeah. <laughs> so what we're looking at doing is we're we're going to do a fundraiser of selling, you know, select number of photos. I think we said 20, 30, somewhere in that range. And so what we want to do is get, and, and it doesn't have to be of the lake. It's just anywhere the state. This year we chose as a charity of the Utah Lake um, Life Preserver. The state, Life Jacket Loaner Program. Life Jacket Loaner Program. And so any proceeds will go to that. We're working with Alan's camera. They're going to do the printing for us. We'll be able to do the sales to them. And so they will be able to help fund, you know, get the funds back to Utah Lake for that. I'm guessing, Sam, you're going to talk a little bit about the Life Jacket program in your presentation. I do have that as a couple of my slides, yep. But it was something that, you know, we came up with like six months ago. Yeah. Something like that as something that, you know, like, it's a good way to just show off all the natural talent we have in this area because there's a lot of talented photographers and you don't always see them outside of just a little small screen it'd be nice to see them on a wall and i'm sure people would love to buy some of these photos too that some people may not even realize they could sell and this way that you know if they're donating it to this this charity it allows them to like you know they can feel a little bit pride that they sold a photo but it's also knowing that you know they're helping out a good cause so how are you going to present them to people? How are people going to see them? So buy we're going to do, we're going to print off, was it 10? 12. 12. 12. 12 photos. 12 photos, and then we'll also have a poster of the rest of them. And then the thought is that they go up, they, you know, they go to the website, scan the QR code, and they go and purchase whatever one they want. Or they can purchase one of the ones that are there, I think is what we said. Yeah. So who, what, who, who's going to be the ones that take the pictures? That is something we still haven't really so, decided, but yeah, we're Jason's looking at apps for submission that potentially have a voting process involved. Oh. Yeah. But the end goal being there's going to be a cap on it of I think 30 is our max we discussed yeah. having. So are you going to ask people from Utah Lake to vote on it? Is that what you're going to do? So that, again, we're still sorting that so down. There, we want it to go to vote, so not there's just the four of us. Have like five people that like <laughs> yeah. stuff that so, they might like see it, but they don't. So there's sure. two different two different types of apps I look at. One is it's a social voting app. So everybody socially votes, kind of like what you've seen in other teams. Oh. Or there's another one that is blind voting where you actually have a blind committee who votes on it. 
I don't know what we want to do yet. So, so we will be looking at it, but it'll be a voting process more than just us four. Yeah. Us four are not picking them. Yeah. Yes. We're going to ask our photographers, other photographers, yeah. to submit one or two pictures from the state of Utah yeah. with the knowledge that they are donating them toward this fundraiser. Yeah. And they will not be used again after this. Like it's, yeah. it's a one off. We're not taking ownership. The commission is not going to reuse the pictures. Unless it happens to be the exact same picture they put in one of our contests or centers or something. But yeah. it's meant to be a donation to help raise awareness of this program and fundraise for it. And we're going to be looking for one location, and we're still working on that location. I have some updates done. I'll okay, share perfect. with you. Okay, good. Where, where we'll have a display up for two weeks, and we're trying to make it a very public location where visitors to the state will see them. And, and it, just to get the publicity out there. As we get this put together and we have the... The, like the blog ready to go. We'll share it on our Facebook page and then we're going to invite you to share it on your Facebook pages and yep. get that out there. Instagram. Instagram library. Library. That's one of them we've discussed, but yep. that was one of Sam's assignments. Sorry, and Jason. And that kind of goes back to even like the Instagram I'm talking about. It'd be nice for her to share it out on Instagram. There's a lot of Utah on there. There is. There's a lot that we can share with you. Just to say Utah. Yeah. yeah. And the one thing that you should be careful is we probably have to ask permission before we share it, just so that we're courteous. Because I don't want it oh, to yeah, make a ban. Oh, yeah, that's right. Some of them have allowed to, to share certain things. Yeah. yeah. And where they know it's a charity event helping a good cause, yeah. a lot of times they, they will say yes. Okay. Air, airport. Airport con, uh, concourse like would be a good one. Yeah. Well, and that's where we would become hoping to partner with you and your, that you could reach out and say, hey, this is available. Yeah. Uh, really, we we All of the don't totally good. understand the whole okay. parameter of what we're doing. Also, Next year, we hope to have a better feel for this. Yes. When somebody goes to submit a photo, are there instructions on what it needs yes, to be, be able yes. to be? Yeah. What well, size? We, we're actually talking to Alan's camera what they want as a recommendation okay. so that we can make sure we get the best quality print back some, to that There's individual. some great photos you can take on your phone, but it won't print big enough yeah. or yeah. And it'll crop down yeah. so much that it won't print And enough. as we're going through the voting process, we'll probably have to look at that just to verify because that may obviously disqualify them if that's the case. But that's a rare <coughs> case I'm hoping. You had a question. Oh, I, I have a or connection comment. at... Uh, it's Ruth Valley. So if you want to, it, they're they're really big on Instagram, and it's yeah. like exploring Tom Valley's for like. Uh, I've seen them. You know, yeah. they talk promotion. And, uh, That'd be great. Yeah, so yeah that, they that they love promoting the, the lake in general too. We've talked with them, but I would love for you to do that because yeah. that's one last thing for me to do. Network can grow our network. So if yeah. you can yeah. give me the information, I can. Yeah. As soon yeah. as we yeah. finish yeah. it, it's going to be on our page right. and start. I will do but it. we are hoping within the next. Probably two weeks, two to three weeks, yeah. to actually have start getting submissions because we actually want to do this for the month of May because that's the uh, water safety National Water Safety Awareness Month. Uh, yep, is in May. Okay. So we're doing a big not, push on the program in that month. Yeah. Not just Utah Lake pictures. It'll be any anything yep. within Utah. That's the only parameter we put out is the state of Utah. Yeah. But your Hawaii pictures just won't be any good here. <laughs> or your <laughs> 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 reason why that is there's more appeal like the Utah is great Utah looks great but the state of Utah is just so beautiful oh, there there's so much appeal. Do, date wise do they have to be taken within a certain date I think we were saying initially two years but right now we don't really have managed. a time frame just because okay. I think we've got to well, figure not, out not really a reason to limit the time frame yeah okay so. and, and that's something to be clear I just know in some photo contests or photo, and some submissions to any photography thing they want this year, I would consider beta because we're learning how to use it. And in this year's, since we're doing it for the first time, we're going to run a lot of things, and we are probably going to make a lot of mistakes, and we're very sorry. <laughs> You're but, getting your money's worth out of us. Yeah. But I think it's going to be great. And for the mobile photography group, people, you can you can blow up to at least a 24 Okay. So. But yeah. So That's, we just wanted to plant the bug in your ear yeah. one more time. Yeah. But we'll be sharing more. I, we're about ready to finalize our last steps on this. Yep. Yeah. 
pretty close. So thank you, Jason. Jason, this was Jason's idea, and I love it. I think what a great opportunity. It's great. I'll clap for that. Yeah. For clap. <laughs> what a great opportunity for us to share what we love. So, okay. Is there any other housekeeping? If not, Time's mine. Sam Brager, he's with the Utah Lake Commission, and he's going to tell you everything you didn't know you wanted to know about the lake. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. I think I've met most of you, but for anybody who hasn't, as Chris mentioned, I work for the Utah Lake Commission. My name's Sam Brager. Um, tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the past, present, and future of the lake. Jason, am I in shot for what you're recording? Are we good? You're on the edge. I'm, oh, darn it. And I'm like one of those rockers, so let me know. Like, just like gently shush me this way if I need to. Is this better? Yes. Okay. So... <clears throat> The Utah Lake Commission, sorry, as I was saying, we're going to do past, present, and future about the lake, some things that have been great in the past, maybe not so good, some things that are being faced right now, and some great things that are happening. Um, I do want to clarify some of the comment about politics earlier. We're not a political group, and I'm not meaning to be political. Um, we're here for the lake. That's the whole point of the commission. So if you have not heard of the Utah Lake Commission, it was founded in 2007. And the idea was that all of these various entities, state, uh, county, local cities, the water district, all came together and said, we need one entity to help everybody coordinate and communicate about what's going on with Utah Lake. It's too large for one of those entities to take on by itself, right? So there's two staff, our executive director and myself, and these are our objectives, the objectives of the commission, which are to foster communication and coordination between all those commission members as well as the public, to promote resource utilization and protection, to maintain and develop recreation access, to monitor and promote responsible economic development, and to encourage and promote multiple uses of the lake. Um, there is a great amount of our work that goes around balancing those various interests and trying to help make the lake the best it can be for everyone for now and in the future. The long and short of it is though, these are some of the photos from our photo contest that we run annually. And I don't know, anybody that took these here tonight? I don't think so. But anyway, the point behind these, I always put these on in any of the presentations I do, is that when it comes to the commission, these are the kinds of things we think of when we think of Utah Lake. Okay? There's a lot of things that need to be fixed about the lake and things that have already been fixed. But this is how we envision the lake and how we talk about the lake to people is the potential it has and the amazing things it does have and the things that are in the works to make it even better. Okay? So I want to talk a little bit about the past. And I do have a lot of slides. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I'm going to be going through a ton of information. I'll try and stay behind for a few minutes at least after um, to answer any questions if you'd rather ask me then. Um, but uh, to start about the past, if you have not watched this already, you need to go on YouTube this weekend, pop some popcorn, grab your friends and family, and watch the Utah Lake Legacy documentary. Okay, It's less than an hour. It's only 58 minutes and some seconds long. And it's a documentary that was put together back in, I want to say 2009, by the June Sucker Recovery Program to talk about the history of the lake. So they go over the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, everything up to when they made the film that's happened at the lake, right? A great synopsis, and honestly, I think a really well done video. And I was gonna do a clip from it in a few minutes, but we're running late and I got a lot of info. So I'm just gonna tell you, surprise, you need to go watch the whole thing. <laughs> um, but it's a great documentary. I highly recommend it, it's a great way to learn. And the way we put it on our website is if you wanna fall in love with the lake, take 60 minutes to watch that. So some of the good memories. The lake in the, in the past was a source of food, a source of entertainment, leisure, and re relaxation, and it has some unique history I want to hit on. So first I wanted to show is, this is just kind of a cool article you can look at. Um, I do actually have it on my website if somebody wants to see more of it later. But this is actually a BYU article on all of the different kinds of fish that were introduced to the lake. So for instance, uh, did I put the right one up? Dang it. Oh no, there it is, right there. You see right up here, carp. In 1882, 200 young carp were introduced in the ponds near the Jordan River. The implantation was successful, population rapidly expanded until very abundant in Utah Lake and lower inlet streams. So carp was introduced as a food source, so that was considered successful. They wanted that, right? But all different kinds of things were introduced. Even eel was introduced at some point. Failed miserably. <laughs> Did not stay. But a really interesting article if you want to learn more about some of the fish at the lake, kind of a fun way to learn. And fishing has long been a central source at the lake. There's been uh, the Loy family, which is the current uh, group that's removing carp. They've actually fished on Utah Lake for five generations, their family. Um, but it was a source of food for the pioneers. It was very important that it be um, <clears throat> during the time that they arrived, as well as during the Dust Bowl era and other eras, as a source of food. 
Um, it's also a source of entertainment, leisure and relaxation. Here's that clip I was going to show. It's my favorite story to do with the lake. Um, it was a boat called the SS Showboat that was made back in the early 19, I think early 1920s. Uh, it could float in as little as 18 inches of water. It held 200 people, wow. a dance hall with a full orchestra and a cafe. And at one point later, it was, it was around for I think uh, somewhere between five and 10 years. And later in the time that it was there, it was booked like a year in advance. Like it was immensely popular on the lake. So kind of a cool story you can learn about watching that documentary. Another cool story that there have been over 20 resorts at Utah Lake, and the last one closed in the 1980s over in Saratoga Springs. Now I see a few nods, some people have heard about that one. Really cool, there's actually a map in, uh, shown on the documentary, and there is a book version of the documentary, so you can find the PDF online too, um, that shows where all those resorts were. Um, also, they had lots of cool things like motorboat races, they had planes landing, that still happens on Sandy Beach sometimes, I don't know if anybody's been down there and seen one of the small, yeah, they should, they're not supposed to, but people would land their planes at the lake and have fun down there, so it's long been a center of culture and relaxation. Some unique things I wanted to share, they're just kind of fun stories, um, these are pictures of the two, so this is actually at Geneva Resort, which was before Geneva Steel the plant, um, it was this huge flume slide that came down. Um, during the Dust Bowl era, there was actually a boxing match held at the center of the lake. They just went out there and decided to duke it out. Kind of a fun story in the book that you can learn a little bit about. Did it dry up completely? So, not quite completely. There was a few puddles here and there, but almost completely. It's the lowest it's ever been was during that era. Now, keep in mind, for anybody who doesn't know, when Utah Lake is full, now granted, during this time, there was not a full. Um, in the 1983 flood that happened, one of the outcomes was a lawsuit from the landowners, and the outcome of that lawsuit was what full was, which is 4,489 feet uh, above sea level, that's full for Utah Lake. So when it hits that level, on average, Utah Lake is only 10 feet deep. So for instance, when I started with the commission back in 2016 was one of our low points. Our average depth in October, I think it was, of 2016 was two and a half feet. So really, really low in 2016. 2019, we actually went a little bit above. Um, the last couple of years, we've kind of floated around eight feet as our max depth, or max average depth. And there's actually a great page on our website called the Water Levels page that has all kinds of charts that show what the lake levels are like right now, what they've looked like over the last 200 years. Really cool to learn more about the water levels. Now the bad about the history, this is a quote from the Utah Lake Legacy. Can you, can you tell I like the Utah Lake Legacy documentary and book? Um, it just says, the abuse of Utah Lake's tributaries and ecosystem began earlier than most people realize. So what comes to mind when you think of abuse, right? Just think about that for a second. A lot of people say algae blooms or Geneva steel, right? There was actually a lot more than just that. Uh, beginning in the 1890s, raw sewage was drained for quite some time, uh, up until just before the Clean Water Act in the 1970s. Um, in the 1880s, sugar mills deposited their waste right into the tributaries of the lake in the Jordan River. Sawmills, um, fertilizer runoff, uh, unscreened irrigation ditches, um, those actually killed off thousands of fish. That was another factor in the um, skewampus nature of the fish in the lake and what fish are there today. And then steel plants as well. So there was a lot of abuse, but in the present I want to talk about some of the recovery efforts. There's obviously been a lot of great work by a lot of great entities and organizations. And most of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are not necessarily Utah Lake Commission projects, but they're things that other people propose, work that's been going on for 30, 40 years, there's a lot of great work, okay? Um, my battery's going down, darn it. We'll see if that dies. So, just to show you a couple different things we'll hit on. Um, again, I'm going to be going through things very quickly. I'm probably still not in the shot, Jason. you got to warn me there if I'm no, wandering right off there. to my left. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> so, one thing I wanted to hit on that's present is this legislative session. There are two bills out there that you may have heard about that are good to learn about and be informed about in regards to the lake. The first being um, HB 232, the Utah Lake Authority Bill. The long and short of it is this is uh, a proposal by a state legislator to create a new entity at the lake and provide um, ongoing funding, which is something the commission has pretty limited. Uh, our funding is through membership contributions. We're not a state entity, so we cannot receive state dollars. So his idea is to try and create a new entity that could basically take what the commission's been doing and continue moving it forward with an ongoing funding source. Um, so you can learn more about that on the legislative website. Uh, the second one I wanted to bring up was HB 240, the Utah Lake Amendments, which is um, amendments to a bill that was passed in 2018 called the Utah Lake Restoration Act in regards to large-scale restoration of the lake and 
uh, this amendments clarify some of that language and then provides more oversight uh, through the legislative um, body as well as through the governor. Is that, is that what's happening down towards, is it down here where they're doing that restoration work on the uh, tributaries? What restoration work? Yeah, the, the program. That oh, the Fort River Delta? Yeah. So I will talk about that one later. Yes, that's actually just north of us. Yeah. Okay. Um, now that would not be considered what I'm talking about with that bill, the large scale. That would be like lake wide. That's just one project here. Um, so one that is lake wide. My apologies. Um, one that is lake wide is the Utah Lake Restoration Project, often referred to as the Islands Project. Um, I'm not here to try and say it's a bad idea or a good idea. Okay. If anybody has questions afterwards, feel free to come chat with me. I'm always happy to share what info I know. It's definitely something to still learn about. What we recommend people do is to go and look at some of the information. So the one I wanted to point out is um, they just submitted their permit to the Army Corps of Engineers. So if you haven't heard of that U.S. entity, they're the ones in charge of the NEPA process, the National Environmental Protection Act process. So it's the first permit process they have to go through. They submitted it in January. There is currently a open public comment period, and there will be a couple others for anybody who wants to provide public input on that. Um, this is the link to their project, uh, their permit, excuse me. So if you go to this link, it pulls up all the documents that they submitted to the Army Corps, and this is the Army Corps website. So you can actually look at it. Um, the whole thing's 507 pages, so just a little light reading. Um, I'm supposed to be reading it, I haven't started yet, um, but it is an in-depth proposal. Um, but you can go check out more information there. This link is on our website. We have a projects page. Now, is this the one that has to do with building the communities on the islands? Yes, that is that. Okay. Project. All right. Yep. So it seems misnamed. Restoration has nothing to do with creating islands that never existed before. So a lot of people, in my opinion, get caught up in that because I agree with you. There haven't been islands, right? That's not a restoration. Yeah. But a lot of people aren't aware that this project actually proposes a lot of things, and mm -hmm. most of them are restoration. They want to help restore Phragmites, which I'll talk about. Uh, they want to restore the fishery and a variety of other things. And they propose islands um, to help with those solutions as well as a funding solution. So you can learn more about it in their proposal. Though. So one thing I also wanted to close on is the Utah Lake Commission resolution this year, 2022, our first resolution, which basically just states that our board, so all of the cities that are on our board, the state agencies and such, um, that we, how do we phrase it? We have a stewardship of the lake, an obligation to care for it, so that our current generation, current generations and future generations can enjoy it as an amazing natural resource. Um, we support the process and policies that are set forth by the Utah Legislature, the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, Division of Water Quality, the U.S. Corps of Army Engine, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's a mouthful, okay? Um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the National um, Environmental Policy Act, which combined with sound science review can successfully guide and vet current and future projects and proposals on Utah Lake. So we support the science and the regulatory processes that are in place to try and review um, the project I mentioned as well as other projects like the Pro River Delta project and others that have gone through that. Um, so that is actually available on our website. We do have a blog post of the full resolution if anybody wants to read it. Now some of the current issues I want to talk about, again, like I said, I've got a lot of info, so feel free to raise a hand if I'm not noticing you have a question. <laughs> Um, algae blooms. This is a common one that I love to talk about because there's a lot of misinformation. So there's three things that we try and hit on, um, which are the know before you go kind of approach, and that's statewide that's encouraged. Um, but for basics, there's a couple different websites you can go to. This is a really long link, but you can learn all kinds of things on the state website for algae blooms, and that's habs.utah.gov, h-a-b-s.utah.gov. Um, that's the site that everybody across the entire state will get sent to to learn more about it or to see what the advisories are. But the three things we try and tell people is understand where a bloom is at, understand what an advisory means, and know that there are things being done to try and uh, fix algae blooms and the issue. So I wanted to show you, so this is that link, habs.utah.gov. This is a map that's on there, so for knowing where a bloom is, okay, a bloom is not necessarily the entire water body. Um, a couple years ago, maybe four years ago, there was one at Deer Creek that literally was about the size of a car that just sat there off their boat ramp for like a week and then just disappeared. But the rest of the, of the reservoir was completely fine. And the same thing can happen at Utah Lake. So when you go to this Google map on their page, you can actually zoom in and they, they sample multiple spots on the lake. And one marina could have an algae bloom and the entire lake could be fine. Or the entire lake could have an algae bloom and one marina could be fine. So it's important to know where an advisory applies because if there's not advisory on the rest of the water body, you can still utilize it. 
Now, the second thing is to know what an advisory means. There's two kinds of advisories generally. There's also a third, which basically just means, hey, it's algae bloom season. Keep your eyes open. That's a pretty simple one, right? Summertime, mostly. But the two advisories are warning and danger. Danger is really easy, okay? Danger means don't go there. <laughs> it doesn't happen super often. Um, usually at Utah Lake, it happens like on a marina or in a bay. The entire lake hasn't been under a danger since 2016, and frankly, that could have been because they actually were only sampling a handful. It may have just been technology that they decided, yep, we're just going to say the whole lake. So it hasn't happened to the whole lake that's been closed. It's usually a marina or a bay, and that means don't go out and do anything on the water. Okay? A warning is more often what happens. Now, this is a little bit blurry up there, so I'll summarize it for you. They point out, do not swim or water ski in this area, wherever that advisory is, okay? They basically don't want you in the water or accidentally ingesting water. If you water ski as crappy as I do, you're going to be ingesting a lot of water because you're going to be falling in it. So that makes sense, right? Common sense. The next one just says, avoid areas of algae scum when boating. So you can still go out if you want to go sailing or you want to go paddleboarding or something. Make sure you look for signs of algae, and on their website, habs.utah.gov, there's lots of great photos and things you can understand on what you should look for. Then the other three are really simple. Keep your animals away, don't ingest the water, don't ever drink lake water. Yeah. And I'm talking about any of the lake water, not just Utah Lake, you don't drink lake water, okay? Please don't do that. Yeah. And clean fish well and discard the guts. I love this one for the anglers because they think if there's an algae advisory, they can't fish. A, you could fish. B, if you want to eat it, you still could. Okay, according to the advisories and how that works with what level of bacteria or toxins there are, if it's still under a warning advisory, that is an option. So a lot of people think that a warning is this terrible thing, but it is a temporary advisory so that you can be informed on how you want to recreate at the lake. Okay? So great information on their website. Regarding fish, just another issue the lake deals with, there, are, there is a fish advisory for PCBs in carp and channel catfish. So that is something... They haven't been able to find what the source is, oddly enough, in their research so far. Basically, all it means is our, this advisory is you should only eat one four-ounce serving of these two kinds of fish per month, right? So there are actually over 40 water bodies in Utah that have some kind of fishing advisory that recommends you limit or do not eat certain fish in that water body. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to confuse and think, oh gosh, Utah Lake's terrible. It has a fish advisory. They're all across the state. Um, and that's the link that you could visit if you wanted to see um, where those advisories apply. So that's another issue. Another issue at the lake is invasive vegetation, right? I actually got a phone call today from a guy who's like, hey, I want to go down and get some photos of that really cool plant down there. It's not cattails. What's it called? And I was like, right, one of these. Really cool. I'm glad you think it's cool. And there are some really beautiful photos. I intentionally chose one that's not beautiful. <laughs> but it, it is a terrible, terrible What are you talking plant. about? I took that picture. <laughs> Rick's like, wait a second. <laughs> no, I, in fact, I'm worried about that. This is taken by a Utah County employee who works on removing it. And I was like, okay, he'll be okay if I use that picture. So Phragmites, people ask, why do we get rid of it, right? Because I, I get from people from Saratoga Springs, for instance, they're like, oh, you're driving away all the animals. That's probably a temporary thing because Phragmites causes lower lake levels. It's a huge fire hazard. You can search news articles even within the last five years of hundreds of acres being burned on accident. It's a loss of habitat. It crowds out everything else. Phragmites, if you do not treat it, can spread up to 15 feet a year, according to statistics. I mean, it's nasty. Well, yes. uh, the, uh, they secrete a toxic chemical from the root system that kills everything else around them. They well, they're take, super aggressive, they and they're like over, aspens. They, they take over by system. killing every other plant around it. Oh, yeah. So they grow through that root system and through their seeds at yeah. the top. They bring yeah. mosquitoes. You lose your native plants, like we said. They crowd them out. You cannot access the shoreline. Has anybody tried walking through this stuff? Yeah. I made that mistake my first winter on the job. I got lost. Like, I was in the frag for an hour trying to find the trail back out. The next time I took my, uh, my machete down just in case, but I was smarter and I didn't. Couldn't get lost. <laughs> Impeded views. This is from like a person's face. Like they can grow up to 15 feet tall. Okay, I've seen some that might be closer to 20. So phragmites is a huge issue with the lake. We'll talk a little bit about treatment down there. Invasive fish, I know I've hit a lot on fish, but northern pike are an issue and carp are an issue. And we'll talk some more about that later. Also limited access amenities. These are some photos from some of the 27 access points. Limited access is an issue. I know 27 sounds like a lot, and I'm proud that that's way more than any other lake that I've heard of in the state. But... There are some key areas you can't reach, or because of Phragmites, you can't get anywhere on the shoreline. What was that? Oh, yeah. 
Totally. So I've got some more information about that. In fact, I did want to hit on, if you're not aware of the map on our website, there's an access points page on our website at utahlake.org that you can actually go to this Google map. And if you do it on your phone and you click on one of these points, there's a directions button you can click and it'll pull it up right in your Google Maps on your phone and you can get to that access point, okay? So it's great that we have 27. Most of them are what we call uh, unimproved access points or sportsman access points because they're primarily used by anglers and uh, waterfowl hunters. So the amenities are pretty basic, right? A dirt road, maybe a gravel boat ramp, it might just be a trail access. But there is work going on to try and enhance those. Yeah, one of them is a ladder you have to climb up and over the fence. Ooh, but don't you love the new ladder? <laughs> I haven't been asked. Oh. oh, okay. So, well, it's, it's basically the same, but somebody damaged the old one. And so last year, I think it was, maybe the year before, we had a new one put oh, in. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's nicer. <laughs> but it's still a ladder over the fence. There are a number of access points that possibly aren't public. There are. So there are plenty of private access points, I would not recommend you go to those. Unless you have a really good connection with that landowner, it's trespassing. Until you get down to that 4,489 foot elevation that is the lake bed that's owned by sovereign lands, you need to be very careful about where you access. So definitely check out this map and find out where your next new favorite spot is. Yeah, we have signs along the lake that says Utah Lake Access Point. Is that, mm -hmm. that's a clue that you can go there, that's not trespassing? Yeah, so that is one of the public access points okay. at that point. Okay. Um, I will say that some of them have been shot up or are missing. We're currently in the process of reviewing where we need to put some new ones in again. Um, as well as it should be clear, that's the access point. If you wander too far away from that, you could enter private land ownership. Um, I think the number our director told me recently, above that 4,489 foot level, there's like over 300 different landowners that butt up against the lake. And that's federal, state, local governments, businesses, right. private residents. So definitely do be careful about where you access. So some current projects that are going on that address some of the things we've been talking about. The Utah Lake Water Quality Study. Okay, algae blooms. The third thing I mentioned was there's something being done about it. So the Utah Lake Water Quality Study is a partnership between the Utah Lake Commission and the Utah Division of Water Quality who oversees water quality regulation in the state, partnered with a variety of other stakeholders, the cities, the wastewater treatment plants, recreation groups, and others are basically putting, they put together this study in 2017 to approach algae blooms from a long-term perspective. Now they're also doing some short-term work. There is some treatments that are being tested out. Uh, you may have seen some of that in the news last summer and in 2020, where they're trying things like copper sulfate or hydrogen peroxide treatments to uh, mitigate blooms once they occur, as well as some preventative measures too. But those are typically short-term responses. And the downside is that could be only good for a couple of days. Um, another downside is it could be very expensive. One of the estimates I heard for the copper sulfate for the entire lake, uh, three or four treatments I feel like it was in a summer, was like four or five million dollars. Okay, so they can be very expensive and they're short-term usually. So this study is funding some of those to test them out with the idea of trying to figure out could they be a good solution in a targeted area, like Provo Bay, for example. Provo Bay gets a lot of algae blooms. So if we could target it quick enough, lower cost, and we could address the bloom before it gets to the rest of the lake, right? So there is some use for a short-term solution, but the study's main focus is long-term. So they're researching basically anything and everything that could be, as much as possible, um, that could be impacting nutrients at the lake, okay? So algae blooms, they are bacteria, the harmful algae blooms, I should be clear. Green algae is great, but it doesn't cause any problems, it's a naturally occurring thing, it's good. Harmful algae blooms, or cyanobacteria blooms, or blue-green algae, don't you just love how many different names we get the same thing? It's a, it's a bacteria, and the problem is those bacteria can cause health concerns as well as the toxins that they emit when they die off. Now these bacteria grow in the right conditions, right? Water in a lake, warm weather typically, sometimes cold weather, but usually warm and nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen. Now those occur a variety of ways in the lake. Uh, they come down from our rivers, agricultural runoff, fertilizer from our lawns, wastewater treatment plants that treat our wastewater in the cities, um, even air deposition coming in from storms, right? So the study is looking at all of those and the outcome is if we can, well, I'll get to the outcome in a second. So they're looking at the study. This, these are the uses of Utah Lake for water quality, which are aquatic life, right? The fish that live there recreation, the use of the lake, and agricultural and secondary water. A lot, almost all of the water that goes downstream goes to irrigation, right, as it goes down the Jordan River. So that's the goals that the water quality study is focused around trying to protect. 
Now, the way that the study works is they're trying to evaluate trade-offs. So this is something that's somewhat unique, hasn't always happened with water quality studies in the past, in that they are trying to consider costs, because it is expensive. So the outcomes of the study, when they finish up in the next, I think it's two or three years, after all the research has been done, they're working on trying to figure out what are the recommendations. Now, this isn't going to be just one number to the wastewater treatment plant saying you need to reduce to X. Um, X micrograms of phosphorus per liter, right? Some kind of number they can quantify and filter and clean the water to, okay? They're not just going to come out with one number. It's going to be more of a range, okay? And the point being is um, this graph from DWQ demonstrates here's where Utah Lake is right now, right? With where the phosphorus regulations are. So in 2015, there was a new rule, and they did that to try and stop from any more phosphorus from coming up and causing more of a problem, right? It's kind of just trying to hold the line. Let's try and not let the lake get worse. The goal of the study is to have several nutrient reduction scenarios with several outcomes, right? So let's say there's five, A, B, C, D, and E. Well, A is going to cost a little bit of money, and it's only going to make the lake 20% better, for example, right? B is going to cost a little bit more and make it 40%. E is going to cost an absorbent amount of money upgrading those wastewater treatment plants, but the lake is going to be 95% better. So then they're going to evaluate, meaning the cities, the wastewater treatment plants, the state will all be a part of this in evaluating what is worth what cost, right? If it's going to cost us $5 million only and it's going to make the lake 50% better, that's great. But if it's going to cost us $5 billion to make it 50% better, is that worth it? Okay. So they're trying to take into consideration both of those. But the outcome will be several scenarios of reducing nutrients further in the lake to, pro uh, sorry, to reduce the frequency and severity of blooms before they happen, right? Thinking long-term instead of just how do we treat it once it happens. So a great study I wanted to make sure I hit on for a bit. Another great project going on right now, you may have heard of, is the Walk Car Away Conservation Project. This is the rough outline of the footprint. It's right up here by Sleepy Ridge Golf Course. Um, this is the Powell Slough area of the lake. Long story short, it's an effort uh, partnering with private landowners and 25 plus different government entities to create a thousand acre open space park. Now to clarify, open space does not mean your typical city park with lawns and all that kind of stuff and a playground. An open space park is a native vegetated area that's managed and enhanced. So. Uh, this is an example of some of that management of vegetation. So this side has been grazed by cattle, and this side has been allowed to grow to demonstrate the difference. Um, we will talk more about Phragmites in a minute. But the project will also include things like a trail. So the trail in Vineyard right now stops somewhere right up here. Um, there are other segments going, and I'll talk more about trails. But this will actually have a large, I think it's 2.5 miles of trail. Um, there'll be some picnic areas, there's going to be an education center for like field trips. We do field trips for fourth graders that would most likely be hosted there. So a great conservation project, a great partnership between a lot of different groups. There's also been a lot of great windfalls recently. So I mentioned earlier that funding has been an issue at the lake. There's not ongoing funding, um, but there has been some recent successes in one-time funding. So one of those examples is Utah County. So we can't, we'd be remiss if we didn't thank Utah County for their help in assigning tourism dollars. Some of our tourism tax dollars that are collected got assigned to Utah Lake back in 2020. There were three projects, one in Saratoga, one in American Fork, and in Vineyard, that received, I think, total between the three of them, it was just over $5 million that were assigned to these. So this is the Saratoga project. They have some of their own dollars, but if anybody's been to, this is the Saratoga Springs City Marina, not the public, or excuse me, not the private HOA marina. This is Pelican Bay Marina on the very south side of Saratoga. Kind of a small marina, they're going to add a, another jetty, a third one, and put in a beach area for non-motorized boating and, and beach access for people, right? So it's a great project. Um, and these are all conceptual plans. They may not be exactly accurate. There'll probably be some changes that'll happen, just FYI. Um, the second one I mentioned for tourism dollars, American Fork City is going to get an upgrade as well. In fact, they've received a couple other grants to help with this so they can repave expand and enhance their beach. They want to put in a concessions area. You can see that dirt parking lot, if anybody's been there, is going to get paved eventually. Some great enhancements at their marina, thanks to those tourism dollars. And then Vineyard. Vineyard is master planning their entire shoreline right now. So their entire jurisdiction, they actually hired a, a contractor, and they're literally trying to take into consideration where they're going to put beaches, where there's going to be trails. They want to put in a pier. And they're master planning, which is something no other city has done involving the lake before. 
So it's a great way they're going to tie their residents. In fact, I think, is this their, yeah, right here, this dotted line. And again, this is an old concept. I think it's already been changed. Uh, but this is just to demonstrate that they're planning out the whole thing. Their downtown promenade is literally going to go right to uh, Vineyard Beach, excuse me, I think is where it is, yeah. So a great draw to bring people naturally right down to the lake and make it a lake community and try and make it a great amenity uh, and a protected amenity for their residents and others. Another great windfall we had recently was some legislative appropriations. Representative Brammer helped secure $9.8 million in 2021 for Utah Lake specifically. As far as I'm aware, that's never happened before. So we're very grateful for his efforts. This is a lot of text. The short version is 2.6 million went to uh, one, two, three, four, five different marina enhancement projects to try and make the marinas better for the public. There was also $800,000 for shoreline restoration, trying to improve access to the shoreline, get rid of some of those bright mighties, put in more trails. Wakar Away received the bulk of that, a little over $4 million to help get their project off the ground. And there were a couple other, uh, there's some algae remediation that dollars were assigned, so a great, great opportunity for more funding to come to the lake and help it improve. Um, a part of those legislative appropriations, some dollars for American Fork, as I mentioned. Here's a new one. Again, this is conceptual. I don't think it's going to look anything like this. But Saratoga Springs is going to be putting in a second marina on the north end of their city. This has long been talked about, and again, there was just no funding for it, no way to make it happen. And the city has been able to secure legislative appropriation and a grant and some other dollars to put in this marina. So would that be up by the, where the dam is located? So this would be north, well, northwest, I'm sorry, northeast or east of that dam. Okay. Um, it's the old McLaughlin, uh, private, used to be a private marina. Is that where like, that deck marina. is out there? Is what was that? Is there like a deck out there in the middle, like that field? Um, I'm not sure about a deck. You, the easiest way to note is this right where Old Saratoga Road bends. Yeah. If you're coming off of Pioneer Crossing, there's you're going to go over to Inlet baseball Park. Baseball Park there. So it's a little bit further east of the okay. baseball park. This right. is um, So if you go to the uh, past the RC this is, Park this is at the and keep going, the it's right over there. This is where the bike trail is. Yes. The bike trail runs right currently. I think it's like right here. It comes yeah. and then it dead ends a little bit. I don't know. It does go right here. That's Old Saratoga Road right there. Yeah. Okay. So this will be another marina at the lake, a public marina where people can go. There's a lot of great discussion going on about offering some really great amenities at this one right now. So stay tuned for that. More information coming on that. Um, I mentioned before the other marina, or sorry, the Saratoga Springs Marina is putting in another jetty and such. That was with the tourism dollars. They also got a legislative appropriation, and this will now all be added in as well. If you've been to that marina, it's the parking stops right here, and it's just this big empty field with some trees, and there's an osprey nest on the pole. So they're actually going to put in some park space, an additional parking, and another exit from the marina. Um, so a great amenity being added to really, really enhance that marina for um, both the local residents and anybody else who's visiting. OK, shoreline restoration. We've mentioned frags, frag a couple of times. We all doing OK? Nobody's fallen asleep yet. I've seen some people taking notes, so that's a good sign. Um, shoreline restoration. So this is primarily focused on Phragmites. Okay, Phragmites is an invasive reed, causes all kinds of problems that we talked about, but there's some great efforts going on to get rid of it. Now, obviously it's probably never going to be permanently gone, just like carp is never going to be permanently gone, at least with the current practices that we use. The way treatment works at the lake, uh, back in 20, oh geez, was it 2008, uh, 2012 I think, um, the entire lake shoreline was evaluated and over 8,000 acres were determined to need Phragmites removal. Okay, 8,000 acres of land, so a humongous project. We're not talking about like your backyard, this is enormous. So the program has evolved a lot since it started. When it started, I'm going to switch back and forth between these two slides a couple of times. They broke up the lake into, I think it was 10 different areas, and each year they tried to hit one or two if they could with grant dollars. Where that's at today, this is actually from 2018, where about half of the lake was finally getting treated. And as of this year, this will probably be the first year that nearly the entire shoreline of Utah Lake will be able to be treated. So that shows some of the progress of the program. Yeah? When you say treated, are you talking more than mowing projects? Great question. So the current treatment program consists of two stages. In the fall, which is recommended by a specialist up at USU in Phragmites, um, in the fall when those seed pods burst, so I should say late summer, early fall, August to first week of September kind of idea, right? Um, when seed pods burst, we do an aerial spray treatment. Now, to be clear, this is not like the, 
the fogging, and everybody's going to die. These helicopters fly 10 feet over the ground, and they drip spray across all these phragmites, these hundreds of acres in a day, right? So that's the first stage. Then mowing is the second stage. That happens the entire rest of the year. They give it like two weeks for the, the uh, herbicide to take effect, and then the guys mow. And when I say it takes all year, I'm not kidding, because they drive eight miles an hour, and there's two of them. <laughs> uh, but they pull. There are these marsh masters right here. They pull a mowing and chopping machine behind them to actually chop that up to open up access to speed along decomposition. Um, so it's a great <clears throat> second stage to help that move forward. Now granted, there's been a lot of changes over the years, like I mentioned. They used to only do one or two areas. They also had these old machines called land tamers. They couldn't access like 90% of the lake. So back in 20... After we evaluated in 2018, they purchased two of these machines, and they can now access 90% to 100% of the lake shoreline, meaning they can function in up to two to three feet of water. So they're semi-aquatic, um, semi-amphibious vehicles. A great enhancement. Another great step that's happening this year, we just submitted our grants. Oh, man, I jumped around on this one. So this project is actually solely funded by grants. Okay? We apply every year to uh, the, it used to be DWR, now it's DNR's Watershed Restoration Initiative. It's a grant program for doing this kind of work, as well as Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. And then we have a couple other partners like Utah County, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, and the commission all chip in to do this. With this year's application, this is pretty cool. Because we've seen such success and we've seen the program expand, there's less and less regrowth in various areas. Some of those areas the helicopter can't get to. Right? So the helicopter has to keep about a 100-foot buffer just to make sure that we're not spraying somebody's lawn on accident. For instance, I mean, some of those homes in Saratoga Springs are right on the lake, right? So one thing to try and enhance that, this year they're actually looking to purchase two drones. So one is an agricultural drone, and another is a, uh, oh, geez, I forget what it's called, this type of uh, camera. Um, no, it's not infrared. Multispectral imaging. So it literally can fly over and according to the imaging that it uses, identify different types of vegetation. So it flies over, maps it all out, and then the areas the helicopter can't get to, these tight little areas right by trails, homes, and such, the agricultural drone will fly and actually apply the, the herbicide directly in those areas. So a really cool development to see that the program has grown so much and has expanded to the whole lake that these large scale machinery, the marsh masters and the helicopters can take care of the big parcels. And some of those small little areas that have just basically not been able to be treated at all before, now have these tools available to try and help enhance them. Yeah, um, or hopefully will, pending our grant application. Is, is there some sort of notification process of when those springs are gonna be about so that people don't wander those areas? Great question, yeah. So all of the landowners are notified because it's actually being treated mostly on, well, it's mostly sovereign land, but all those private landowners I mentioned, they do receive notice. Um, as far as people being out there, like I said, the helicopter, when it's flying over, it can do several hundreds to even thousands of acres in a day, depending on the weather and such. However, they're all trained in these things. They don't just watch out for people and don't spray if there's people, they watch for livestock. Even though it is livestock certified safe for ingestion, they're still being as precaution. Precautious. They're being as cautious as they can. <laughs> Taking precautions. Um, so there isn't a wide-scale notification, but it's mostly because there's not that need, right? Um, I don't think I've heard over the 10 years they've been doing this, or 12 years, I don't think there's ever been an instance, at least that I've personally heard back, that someone got sprayed, right? Um, in fact, that's why they're... <clears throat> That's why the helicopter has so many limitations, like I said, that 100-foot buffer. He doesn't even go up. I think he's the, the contractor they use, if it's five mile an hour winds or higher, he will not take off because they're being so careful to apply it only in areas um, that are where they're wanting to spray. It's a great question. So, yeah? How does it affect birds? That's a good question. So again, the birds, the only thing I've heard possibly is that the Marshmaster crew, I talked with them about that, of you know if there's a bird nest or something. The two guys, or the three guys that work on these, most have been doing it for the last four or five years. Very few instances have their, like have they actually had a bird fly right up in front of them. Usually any effects are minimal and short term, and none of the wildlife are, are really impacted in a severe way. And it's monitored to see if there would be some other kind of effect as a part of the grant program. So long and short of it is, Phragmites has been a huge issue. It does continue to be, and all of these efforts, as amazing as they are, it will not be a permanent solution. There's Phragmites all across Utah and all across the nation. So it is a management program, meaning the goal right now is to get it under control and then continue to keep it under control. 
okay? So Fragmite is a great one. CARP, another one that I mentioned before for management. The June Sucker Re Recovery Program has done an amazing job since the 1980s to work on restoring the endangered June Sucker. Now it's no longer endangered. That's one success from last year is that it was downlisted to threatened status. Only five, including the June Sucker, only five fish have ever had that accomplishment reached. Okay, so some amazing work has happened. And I am going to hit on the Pro River Delta project that was brought up in just a minute. Um, carp removal, though, is one big one. Um, obviously, I can answer a lot of questions later. The long and short of it, they've removed a ton. The goal, starting in 2009, was to reduce the carp biomass, which is the total poundage of carp in the lake, by 80, or excuse me, 75%. In 10 years, they were able to get it down to 83%, a reduction, sorry, right? So 75% reduction, instead they hit 83. However, using commercial fishery, which is what they've been doing, is not a permanent solution. So right now, they're doing just like we are with Phragmites. They're keeping the population low and they're researching other alternatives. There's a lot of really interesting research around carp specifically and how to try and eradicate or manage that species. So the June Sucker program has had some amazing success there are still some obstacles moving forward that they're trying to address, like northern pike, trying to make sure that doesn't become a problem for June sucker and other fish. But there have been a lot of great things that have happened too. This is Hobble Creek. I don't know if everybody, anybody's been down to the Hobble Creek Wildlife Management Area access point at the lake. Yeah. They actually did that project, and they also did the pro, they're doing the Pro River Delta project that's recreating habitat. So that's kind of the next phase they're focusing on with June sucker program, which I'll hit on in just a minute under our future section. So some future things I wanted to hit on. I didn't put it on here, but I know I have a slide for it. Um, the trail plan uh, and a few other things. This is the trail plan of the lake. The goal is to have one continuous trail around the lake. Now, that looks really big, so I'm going to kind of narrow it down. This is a map on our website that was put up together by Mountain Land Association of Governments. Um, that's basically UDOT for Utah County. Um, it's a great tool. You can look at all kinds of city trails, Utah Lakes Trail, and all kinds of other information. I highly recommend it. Um, because of time, I won't show you it, but I have it pulled up on my computer if somebody's interested. What I wanted to focus on tonight is some, ooh, is some of the new and upcoming trails. So on the map, brown is completed, pink is planned, yellow is concept. So concept basically means we threw a line on this map. <laughs> <laughs> right? We like the idea. We haven't talked to anybody about it probably. It's pretty far out. You'll notice... That's most of the lake that doesn't have population along it, right? So again, most projects do focus on where the highest amount of population is. So the ones in pink that I circled, we actually need to get that updated. I just realized this is an old picture. That little section, I believe, is actually done. That was in vineyard. I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, but I think that's a vineyard stretch. Um, these other ones here are scheduled to be completed in the next, let's see, 2022. So I would think in the next three, maybe five years at the most. So this section right here is primarily walk car away, as I mentioned. They got half their funding last year in a legislative appropriation. They also got the other half of their funding from MAG, that entity I mentioned, Mountain Land Association of Governments, for 2023 is when it's earmarked for. So a two or three year, hopefully, construction timeline. We're looking at 2025, 2026. That section will be done. This section is from Linden Marina all the way over to what's called North Shore Park in Lehigh. You may have heard of Loch Lomond Pond in Saratoga Springs. So that's where the trail dead ends right now. This is about another two and a half or more section of trail that will be done. They got all of their funding for that project, earmarked for 2023, already assigned to them. Is this trail dirt or is it? So where possible, it's always the goal to try and get it paved. In fact, Utah County actually already agreed and continues to agree that if anybody will build it paved, and I think it's like a 10 foot wide requirement is what they require to allow their trucks, they'll maintain the entire thing. They'll handle that for anybody that's willing to do it. So <clears throat> where possible it's paved, I will say that because in Saratoga Springs, you'll see where I circled is brown already. It did have a dirt trail, but they just got funding. This is hopefully gonna be done this spring or summer. They're gonna pave most of that section um, that was already existing dirt, okay? Um, so some really great improvements on trails that are happening. So let's say approximately five years from now, you can go, this cuts off, but basically from the border of Springville and Provo, you could go all the way over to Saratoga Springs in one trail. And this trail connects into the, the Jordan River Trail. It connects into the Provo River Parkway Trail. And via city trails, it actually connects into the uh, Murdoch Canal Trail. So you could go from Utah Lake to any of the three surrounding counties. So really cool project to bring trails in at the lake that's going on. 
Um, okay, so one that I'm personally involved with uh, as our staff, the commission was invited to be on this fishing advisory committee. I know I talked a lot about fishing. It's because there's a lot of great changes that are happening. This has never happened before. DWR was somewhat had their, they had limits imposed on them because of the endangered status of the June sucker. And so because it was downlisted to threatened, they can actually, they can actually develop an advisory management plan for fishing at Utah Lake. So they can begin to try and actually manage it instead of allow just June sucker to take the forefront. So that's a committee that's starting. We have our first meeting next week. I'm really excited to see where that goes um, <clears throat> in helping to develop that plan and advise DWR on how to improve the fish that are at the lake for those who are interested. Life jacket loaner program. See, Chris, I told you it's in here. I just had to get through like, you know, 40 slides to get through it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So the life jacket loaner program is something we just started last, or excuse me, two years ago working on, which is in conjunction with the families of Priscilla Bienkowski and Sofia Hernandez, the two friends who unfortunately lost their lives on Utah Lake. Um, in that particular incident, they did not have life jackets on. Um, their family approached Utah County about doing a life jacket loaner station at the Knolls, which is technically now a public access point. It wasn't as of three years ago, two years ago. The county acquired it. Um, so there's BLM land, but the actual access at the lake, ah. that was owned by the LDS Church um, until I think it was 20, was it 2019? I'd have to look. But 2019-ish, Utah County acquired it and made it. It's still kind of in process, but it's a pseudo public access point now. Um, there's still some paperwork stuff with DNR. they got to figure that all out, right? So Utah County sits on our board. They came to us and let us know that the families wanted to do this. And so we partnered up with them and said, hey, let's not stop there. Let's expand it. Let's make it more available. This is a really big lake. There's a lot of access points. And some people don't have life jackets, right? So the program is centered around educating about water safety and making life jackets more readily available to those who need them at the lake. So that was the design of the station. This month, or this year, is gonna be the kickoff of this program. Uh, I believe it was last, sorry, not last year, two years ago in September, we did a, a life jacket donation drive you may have heard about where we collected gently used life jackets or monetary donations to help get the program started. So we're now continuing that effort. We have um, the funding in place from the commission and from donations to build six life jacket stations. And I didn't put the map on there, but they're at six very popular access points. Not here, because they actually have their own. State Park statewide operates their own life jacket learning program. Um, but we're putting them in at all four other marinas at the lake. So Linden Marina, American Fork, Saratoga Springs, and Lincoln Beach. And then we're also putting them in at uh, Vineyard Beach. And I want to say Sandy Beach might be the last one, possibly. Um, so we're launching that program soon around those goals. This year, May, for Water Safety Awareness Month, we're going to be launching the program. By that, I mean the stations are being built this... Thank you. I told you. I don't know if you want it, Rick. I mean, that wasn't working for a second there. Um, so we'll be launching the program. There'll be a, a, an awareness campaign that will go out on social media and such. Um, we'd love it if people help share that. We're also doing two fundraisers. The photo fundraiser was brought up. And there is a local kayaker who reached out to us, and we started a Paddle with Care event. So this is something that the commission has partnered with those volunteers on to do a, a fundraising event for paddleboarding, kayaking, canoeing, anybody who wants to participate. They're going to paddle from Vineyard Beach all the way over to American Fork Marina. So it's a two and a half mile paddle. Probably not for me because I'm a novice paddler. I don't think I'd make it that far. Um, but a great way to raise awareness and there'll be some water safety stuff with that. So a great program that's getting started, like I said, to raise awareness about water safety, educate people. For example, I don't know if you knew, but uh, 12 and under are required to wear a life jacket. If they're going out into the lake, if they're going on a, a boat, they need to wear one. Everybody else needs to have one readily accessible, but we encourage everybody to wear them. State law says, though, if you're 13 or older, you don't have to. Something people don't realize, though, if you go out on the water on just like a floaty, like a tube or like a, a, a what do you call it, like a pool mattress, an inflatable mattress or something, if you go more than 50, 50 feet past the shore, like away from shore, you're required to have a life jacket on. That's considered a watercraft at that point. So there's a lot of things about water safety that people don't realize that we want to make sure that we can educate on, not just provide life jackets at those stations. So a great program that we're getting started up. Some other projects I wanted to hit on. This is one I'm personally really excited about. It's happening right now. I put it kind of in the future section because it's not done yet. It will be done by June of this year. <clears throat> but the, the plan is we applied for two different grants and secured the funding 
to put up a network of live video feeds at all five public marinas at the lake. So at each marina, it'll look something like this. This is the Saratoga Springs Marina currently. But there will be views. Here's some snapshots we took from where the camera will go. There will be some views showing the lake. This is going to be where their new beach area is going to be, right over here. Um, there will be one usually of where the boat launching and traffic will go. There will be a view of parking. And then there will be a view of the entrance, typically. The important thing, personally, to note about the entrance views is that we will use these cameras and the artificial intelligence to track visitation at the lake. There is currently no tracking of visitation at the lake. There are some estimates via revenues and things like that at some of the marinas, but this will actually provide counts of this many people came in on bicycles, this many people drove in, or these many cars came in. They're not going to really count people in the cars. Um, the same tracking, we're hoping, is going to be applied for boats, so we can actually track boats that are coming in the room. So some great enhancements for the marina operators, but also great offering for people who want to visit the lake. You can sign on to utahlake.org about six months from now, hopefully, and you can look at the marinas and try and decide, right, which one's busy, or does it look like there's an algae bloom in one and not in the other? So it'll be great information for people to figure out where do they want to go at the lake and look at the conditions of the lake. So I'm very excited to see this one happening. This actually was an idea that was given to us by a vineyard resident. He's an avid boater, saw it happening at a different lake he visited, and was like, you guys should try and do that here. And we made it happen, thank heavens, to a grant. <laughs> so a great project. Pearl River Delta Project is an amazing project that's going on right now. As I mentioned before, the June Sucker Recovery efforts have long focused on carp removal, collecting a lot of research right now. They're continuing those efforts, but focusing on creating new habitat for young June Sucker and other young fish to be able to grow to adulthood. That's one of the biggest issues the program faces right now. They've been stalking uh, June Sucker that have been raised in captivity for the last uh, 10 or more years. It might be as many as 20 or 30 years. The biggest issue is not a lot of them arrive at adulthood. They get eaten by predator fish. So the Pro River Delta Project is north of where we are tonight. This is Utah Lake State Park right here. Okay. So the project boundary, I'll do the laser here to try and help, is all of this right here. It's about 250 acres of land. So they're going to have to reroute the river to do that? Then? Great question. Technically, yes. What I mean by that is there will still be water in the existing channel. But the majority of the water will go down the new delta. So what's going to happen is they started construction in 2020. The entire project is targeted to be done by end of 2024. So they're about halfway through it. Um, on their website, ProvoRiverDelta.us, again, I've got the links. People will see this video. You can go visit it and see how far along they are. But the idea is right down here, which this is the new Lakeview Parkway. So if you've seen that road when you drive out here where it's just a bunch of dirt on the north side of the road, that's this road right here, okay? So just east of that, the river will be diverted. Now the lower channel will be maintained. They're gonna put in a dam down here by the state park, and this will kind of turn into a very long, skinny community pond. By that I mean is the levels will be kept at a pretty stationary level, and it will be very slow moving. But they're gonna be putting in some kayak and canoe access points, some fishing points, it'll be a great community amenity. And then the majority of the water will be diverted through the Pro River Delta project. Now this entire area, approximately, and more I think to the south, was all the River Delta before settlers arrived and it was agriculture and things like that. So they're restoring a large portion of the Delta that was there because of the variety of benefits. Primarily habitat for the June sucker and other fish. It also is a great filtration system for nutrients that come downstream. Um, it's also a great recreational amenity. So they're actually, if you can't really see the icons very well, but there are going to be kayak and canoe put-ins where you could actually go down through these channels and into the, po oh, geez. <laughs> into the ponds and out to the lake through this delta. So can you imagine being able to take your camera and be able to float down through this and see some of those, well, you probably won't see great blue heron, they're smart enough to fly away. But you might see some, some fish or some birds or other people out in this delta. It's meant to be for the recreation as well as for the wildlife. So a great project. Um, like I said, their website is a wealth of information. They have all kinds of story maps showing where they're at, some of the work that's been done. There's volunteer opportunities. A really, really amazing amenity that's being worked on for the lake. And isn't it very used for fishing, too? Yes. But so there, it will be the managed fish, by... The, fish, the fishermen are going to hate to be quiet. <laughs> well, well, welcome to Utah the Lake. Will be in the <laughs> I would agree. So that's yeah. something that has to be balanced all yeah. around the lake. So I think there's going to obviously be regulation. Some people have asked about like waterfowl hunting, would it be allowed? All of that's gonna end up being 
a decision by Division of Wildlife Resources who's going to manage it once the project's done. Um, so not all of that's been determined yet, but there are going to be amenities. I mean, you'll notice these little binoculars. That's going to be a bird viewing tower is the plan right now, too. So their goal is to try and offer a variety of amenities. Provo's putting in a public park right at the diversion. This trail, this orange line. So Skipper Bay Trail right here, this yellow line. This half will no longer exist once the project's done. It's been closed off already. It's getting rerouted right along the side of the delta. And then you can come out to the park, or if I remember correctly, Provo City's putting in a trail that will come right up here. And then this is getting into Wakara Way, where I mentioned that trail will tie in and then take you even further north. So a lot of great amenities, though. But I think I did. You have your hand raised? Yeah. yeah I just wondered about that Skipper Bay Trail. I missed that. Oh, I know, I and I loved it too. It was a I great know. trail. The issue they ran into is the cost of trying to maintain it because they have to cut in these four channels for flows. They have to have great desert. They, I mean, the mitigation costs, putting in um, what do you call them, boardwalks, are significantly more expensive. And so instead, they actually, if you look at like square footage, or not square footage, but like length, you're getting much more of a trail along here, um, as well as some of the other amenities. It was just determined that that was probably the best solution was to close it off. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But I agree, it would have been a pretty cool site. It would have been. I but, think it, oh, I hope they build bridges or something. Sure, here, but, yeah. totally. So I think when they looked at it, they wanted to try and balance providing as many amenities as they could, as well as accomplishing their, their objectives within the budget that they had for it. Uh, but a great project. One I'm really excited about, again, I encourage you to go to their website, uh, ProvoRiverDelta.us. has a ton of info. <clears throat> one, yeah, one last project, and then we're all done. Good thing, too, because my voice is getting tired. I'm going to take a drink here. <laughs> um, this is another one that we're hoping happens soon. The commission just applied for dollars through DWR's Habitat Council program to improve some of those, including the one with the ladder. That's uh, file post 13 improve some of those a little bit more, some of the access points that don't have as many amenities. So we chose five um, based off of what we could estimate off of visitation as well as some of them being in sore condition than others, like mile post 13. That fence got destroyed, unfortunately, last that's, year. Uh, that's where the church farm, LDS church farm is on the west side? Uh, yes, if I remember correctly, I think it is, yeah. Um, so these five, Swede Lane, Mulberry Beach, uh, mile post 13, Mill Race, and Lincoln Point, um, we applied for dollars to do a variety of types of improvements, regrading the roads. I don't know if anybody's been out to Mill Race recently. That's the one that's on Provo. I don't know if I did. It's just uh, 1400 right. North in Springville. So it literally comes like right here. Yeah, 1400 North, and you head north yeah. along the dike road. Right. It's a terrible road. I don't know how I didn't get four flat tires driving it the last <laughs> time. It's, it's horrendous. Yeah. So um, we're looking at trying to regrade the roads and provide better access, put in some better boat ramps. Um, Replacing some of the fencing, trying to make sure we respect those private boundaries and guide people. Some better signage, as I mentioned, some signs are missing. We need some more signage. We'd love to see if we can get some fire rings in. There's some legal limitations on that. There's no fires allowed on the shoreline of Utah Lake. Um, that's a state code for forestry, fire, and state lands. Um, but we'd love to see that happen if we can. And then, obviously, removing some additional invasive vegetation, some of those trees that are problematic. The bigger program focuses on Phragmites but Russian olives and tamarisk are a part of that as well. So this one's really cool. We have not heard back as of yet. I think we're supposed to find out in the next couple of weeks if we got the grant dollars for this. Um, but that being the case, our goal, the commission would like to have this done by fall. Um, but we'll have to see how that all works out with the grant. So to sum it all up, going back to my slide with all of our photos, Utah Lake has long been a center of the valley. In fact, I read a book called uh, Oh, geez, Zion's Mount, I think it's called, um, was written about how Timpanogos was created as a landmark. If you look back into the settler ages, Timpanogos wasn't on a map. It didn't exist. It was just a mountain. It used to be called Utah Lake Valley. It wasn't just Utah Valley. And so the lake, even since before then, with Native Americans, with early settlers, and today is a centerpiece of our valley. And there's a lot of great things going on. There are definitely things that still need to be improved. Don't get me wrong. And there's things that we'd love to see changed and things that we'd love to see restored or enhanced. I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as a lot of people think. <laughs> now, granted, like I said, there's things that aren't great. I hate midge flies. Can I just say that? We didn't talk about midge flies tonight, but I hate them. We all do. They're terrible, especially for photographers taking beautiful sunset photos. I hate midge flies. They don't. And I, 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 I tell everybody that, right? It's like they, they, they squirm and they, I mean, they... Uh, 
I've seen them like down a strip of a trail. Oh, yeah. Like a bug name. You, you like look at them and you turn around and walk the other way because you don't want to walk into the cloud. Yeah, so there's definitely things that happened in the past that were not great. So you just hit the there's up. definitely things going on right now that need to be changed and fixed. But there are also a lot of great things going on. So remember that, as I mentioned before, our staff, and we encourage others to see the potential the lake has, to see the beauty that it does have to offer and the potential that it has to be protected and enhanced for the future as well. If you want to be able to get involved or learn more, um, you can learn more about the lake on our website. UtahLake.org is a great spot. Um, there's opportunities to volunteer with some of the events that go on, some of the cleanup projects that happen at the lake. Um, you can go to public meetings is a great way. I know that sounds really boring, and sometimes public meetings are boring, but they're also a great way. Our quarterly board meeting, if you want to just get a massive update for an hour and a half on what's going on at the Utah Lake, or at Utah Lake, that is a great way to learn because that's where we share with our board all of the projects that are going on at that moment. Um, obviously, we can do more presentations. We do them like this one tonight. Thank you again for allowing us to come. It's something we love to do with groups. And share with people. Tell them to go to our website. Tell them to go find the Utah Lake podcast. Tell them to follow us on social media so they can learn more about the lake. They can learn about the history, about the projects that are going on, about events that are happening, about the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the various uh, programs that we offer, like the photo contest or the Utah Lake Festival or some of the other third-party events that are out there, like Linda Marina has worked with a group to do a movie on the water before. It was Jaws. Just <laughs> can you imagine sitting on a tube on the water watching Jaws? I can only imagine. So there's a lot of great potential to the lake, a lot of great ways to learn more about it or get involved. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and Thank just you. brain dump on you guys about all there is to Utah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we had that chance. Very educational. That's what it's for. And I think. Talk about the elephant, Sam. The elephant. What elephant? We just drank from the fire hose, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I would call it a fire hose. What's that? Awesome. Well, I guess did anybody have a question, something they wanted to understand about it? We, to be, to be clear, the commission is neutral on that project. We're happy to share information. Again, you're going to learn a lot more reading the permit packet than I can provide you. Yeah, right. Just some light reading. Yeah. Well, if Tom Clancy wrote it, I'll read it. Someone read it and tell us about it next week. Yeah, give us a summary. Right. Well, and granted, you could always go to the, the project proponent's website. They have an email form if you have a specific question. I'm sure they're happy to answer it. Um, they've started a couple other websites recently. Their main website is, uh, ooh, geez, is it, I think it's utahlakerestoration.com, I think is their main page that has all of their proposal info. But I think the Army Corps permit's probably the better way to look at it, um, because you can look at the various ideas that are being proposed. Um, that is a group who is opposed to the idea, yes. I don't have that information. Again, this isn't a commission project, so I don't have all the information on it. Um, I'm sure that will come up under the Army Corps permit process, so there will be more info. She asked about how many residences. I've heard all kinds of numbers thrown out, 200,000, 300,000, 500. I mean, it feels like it's bigger every time. Of course but, it is. So now, um, does part of that algae bloom problem come from the shallow nature of the lake? The warmth and the shallow nature, or is it just the warmth? So that's actually a really interesting question for a comparison. I actually asked uh, the water quality study. They have a panel of scientific experts, yeah. half of which are local Utah scientists. Yeah. Um, Utah Lake, excuse me, I should say scientists. And others are nationally renowned about algae bloom specifically, right? Nitrogen, phosphorus, this kind of stuff. And I had somebody ask me, they're like, well, what about carp? Do carp help, or do they hurt algae blooms? And I went to the science panel. I was like, hey, I don't, I don't know the answer to this question. He's like, well, both. And the same thing applies to the shallow nature of the lake. It's really not that simple. There are good and bad. So for instance, carp, my example, right, to compare. Um, carp help stop algae blooms because they stir up the nutrients at the bottom of the water or the bottom of the lake bed, right, which makes it cloudier, less sunlight penetrates, less growth. The same sediment that they're stirring up has a bunch of nutrients in it and provides more food. So the same thing with the shallow nature of the lake, right? Because it's shallow and more sediment can get stirred up, it prevents, and that's from wind and such waves, right? That can prevent algae blooms or reduce them. However, again, because it's shallow and the sediment can get stirred up, it provides more well, food for algae Shallow, blooms. Shallow makes it hotter. It makes it warmer. It does make it warmer. And that contributes to it as well. The reason why I ask is because one of the things that the proponents of the project are, are, are using 
is they want to dredge the lake, make it deeper, mm -hmm. use that soil that they dredge up to build the islands, and they say by making the lake deeper, it will reduce the algae bloom problem because it'll it won't be so shallow, and I just wonder what the validity of the science is there. So again, I'm not a scientist, and I'll have to. I haven't read through everything in the permit. I know their packet has like 13 pages of scientific links in it or something. Um, but I, the premise behind that is, if you make it deeper, waves can only reach a certain depth, from what I understand uh, behind the science on that. Um, and so, if you make the lake deep enough, the lake waves can't stir up that sediment. I guess is is, is what I. Okay. At least, if, if what they've said is correct, that's okay. what I believe their it's, reasoning behind that is. Okay. Can I ask you just a quick question, totally off this subject? Sure. Um, Sandy Beach. Up yeah. Right. Oh, I didn't bring up Sandy Beach. Are you asking about the improvements you're yes. seeing down there? Oh, I yes. love Sandy Beach. So that one's been planned for several years. It's taken a while to happen. There were some land dispute issues with the private landowners down there that they finally resolved. Um, but that's a partnership between Utah County and Utah Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. Um, they started work last fall. The goal is, there's been a couple of issues. Obviously, it's not the greatest amenity, it's just a beach, right? right? But there's also been access issues. Obviously, if you've been down there, you've seen people love to drive everywhere, mm -hmm. and that's not okay. Not supposed to do that. That affects the soils on the lake, it affects vegetation, a variety of things. Right. So they're actually rerouting and providing an access road that goes down along the water line so that people could drop off equipment and get down closer, and a parking area, an actual parking area, believe it or not, <laughs> at Sandy Beach, as well as they're planning on putting in some pavilions and picnic tables. They're going to put in restrooms. So there's actual uh, restrooms, yeah. right? <laughs> restrooms available. We don't need those. Um, so oh, they're wait, planning on wait. putting a variety of those basic amenities in. They're going to regrade the road again. A lot of the roads need to be regraded. It's kind of that That's time. That's hard to get. So. Points fun to get to on those roads. Oh, geez. That, I, I wanted to put that one on the list because it's so far. We were trying to figure them out. But that's one that needs it, too. The road to LeBaron Point is a rough one. I usually take my truck, not my sedan on that one. Yeah, that one was fun. I think I only did that one. So that yeah. So that one, I, I believe, they started last fall. I believe they're hoping to have it done by the end of this year. Oh, okay. Um, but so far, I think all they've done is clear a bunch of the vegetation. I think they did reroute, finally. Somebody told me on the phone earlier today that they went down a different way than they were used to. I don't oh. know if they were supposed to. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so there's at least work being done on the reroute, but it's not being done well, right now. Well, they've got the so. parking area from what I saw when I was there a month or so ago. Oh, okay, because I haven't been down there it's that close. recently. I mean, it wasn't paved or anything, but yep. they had... When I don't think they will ever pave, I want to oh, be clear. Oh. They're just going to regrade it and put oh, down okay. better road base, because right now it's just dirt. I yeah. think they'll put down mm -hmm. rock, Yeah. but they didn't Which find they were doing. So. Yeah. So that one's a great one. I'm really excited to see that too. That's a really popular beach. And obviously for wildlife and recreation, it's a great spot for the lake. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So I hear slide for the walk away. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, sorry. That picture I took, I snagged from, they actually put in, uh, was it two or three uh, bird nest towers? Um, right off of the, the golf course, I believe all of them were. And there's already, I think, one or two of them already had osprey nests and had hatchlings on them this last summer. That was done, I think, spring last year, if I remember correctly. So there's a couple. <coughs> excuse me. There's a couple of birds nests out there, and they wanted to try and restore some habitat and allow the ospreys. And hopefully, they've talked about trying to do it for bald eagles even eventually to provide better bird habitat in the area. So that area is like a bird. Um, not not a bird refuge per se. Um, Powell Slough itself used to be um, the greater area of the public lands. It used to be what's called a waterfowl management area. It's not technically considered that anymore, meaning DWR manages it specifically for waterfowl, but it is one of the prime waterfowl and, and bird habitat areas on the lake. So the Wakara Way includes that as one of the elements it wants to enhance, providing better habitat, getting rid of the Phragmites. They also want to provide trails for people. Um, another area of that footprint is going to be preserved for hunting um, so that they can try and preserve that because it's very popular in Powell Slough currently today. So that project, like many of the projects, tries to balance as many of the stakeholder interests and recreation interests of the lake as they can. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Hey, my pleasure.